today I'm planning to speak on um, North American uh, region and the Basin and Range province in the Colorado Plateau in the United States. So that's the outline of the area, more particularly the Colorado Plateau. It's surrounded in the west and southwest by another region I'm about to discuss. And that Colorado Plateau had an initial period of uplift of about a kilometer, 80 to 50 million years ago. That occurred a fraction of a millimeter per year, of course, 0.03 millimeters per year. And it was later uplifted again by about a kilometer between 35 and 15 million years. That actually is the time in which the Mount Gambier limestone was deposited. Not that that's got any bearing on the matter, but just to put it into context, in that case, it was somewhat faster uplift. And uh, uplift has continued really in the last uh, 5 million years. And this is accounted for a deep erosion of the Grand Canyon and also the river capture that actually uh, resulted in the Colorado River running um, west and south into the uh, Gulf of California. Previously, the drainage all went off to the northwest towards uh, Columbia's written up there along the coast in the north, and uh, it just got diverted much more recently to go west and south. We did discuss this on a previous discussion of the North American plate, Spreading Ridge, uh, sees most of the Juan de Fuca plate subducted beneath North America and uh, it reappears to the south as the Cocos plate. They're quite, apparently quite separate and uh, where the break occurs between them, I guess, you've got fairly shallow subduction under the Basin and Range province and that accounts for the enormous uplift. Uh, it's a relatively shallow uh, subduction in that region and there's therefore excess heat that's caused uplift of the Colorado Plateau um, over the last 80 million years and um, probably the first subduction of the spreading center itself of the that's the Pacific Ocean spreading center caused an extension of the basin and range province uh, which has pulled it apart uh, subsequently and we'll see some evidence of that during the talk. So there's the picture of the um, Farallon Plate or the eastern half of the Pacific Ocean sliding in or subducting beneath the uh, Sierra Nevada and the Colorado Plateau. And its shallow angle of dip accounts for excess heat and the uplift of that region. Now I say uh, from the underneath, it records uh, shallow subduction of a flap of the Farallon Plate 50 million years ago has resulted in the uplift of the Colorado Plateau, the reversals of drainage, river capture, and down cutting of the river canyons. Subduction of the mid Pacific rise only 20 million years ago led to almost 100% expansion of the basin and range region. That's uh, effectively the area shown as the Sierra Nevada on that diagram. So it's been stretched uh, really. Um, in the uh, last 20 million years, almost 100%, meaning it's doubled in, uh, in length due to the pull of that subducting plate. And this is the region we're talking about. This is a lozenge near the center of this picture, which is the Colorado Plateau. And it looks as if it's surrounded by sand dunes in the west um, and south but they're not sand dunes at all. They're major ranges, um, of which Death Valley is one, for example, and they're all individual fault blocks, hundreds and hundreds of them. And uh, that's the result of the extension I've been talking about. So here's another satellite image, and you can see this uh, extraordinary pattern of caterpillars crawling their way northward in the Basin and Range province. Now those are fault blocks, which we'll look at in, in cross section in a minute, whereas the Colorado Plateau is just a, a more regional uplift um, with faults, particularly along the eastern side. You can see a north-south trend there, um, which is a sort of rift or monocline and a, a normal fault pattern along that eastern edge of the Colorado Plateau. 
Now, I mentioned this subduction. This picture perhaps gives the impression of a fairly steep subduction of the Farallon Plate under North America. Uh, obviously, up at the, the top surface there is North America with the Rocky Mountains showing in brown at their highest uh, peaks and the Western Plains in far green, Denver and places like that in central USA. Um, really, the flat section isn't very well illustrated by this. It's effectively shown in purple and is largely hidden uh, because it's such a flat lying section. And then it breaks away and steepens. Uh, there are a thousand or more kilometers of the Farallon Plate um, going down into Earth's mantle there. And the writing says the model of the Farallon Plate beneath the Western USA. This is the only, the eastern half of the Pacific Ocean crust. Because the Pacific Plate, as we see it today, is the other half of the uh, spreading ocean. Now back to the Basin of Maine province. Um, and you can see uh, states of Nevada, California, Utah, and Arizona, marked with us just the initial letters. And the Basin and Range Province, as I said, is an extraordinary array of faults re resulting from this whole area separating and doubling in, in area. So if you look at the state of Nevada, it was only half that width um, 20 or so million years ago. It's an extraordinary thing to see. And then uh, the Wasatch Mountains and up in the right-hand top corner, the Salt Lake, where Salt Lake City is, and, and the Wasatch Mountain chain, which has some very similar geology to our Flinders ranges. And it may well have been uh, quite close to us in the initial period of deposition. That then shows the uh, Basin and Range province in all its glory. And how did it originate? Well. Originally, obviously, the sediments were more or less horizontal, a whole series of what are called reverse faults or thrusts due to compression occurred in that basin and range region. But in the last 20 million years, as a result of the uh, uh, shallow subduction of the Farallon Plate and also the uh, whole central spreading ridge of the um, uh, Pacific Ocean uh, has been subducted there so that you've got a, a resulting extension and the whole region has been uh, pulled apart and you get what are described as normal faults. So they're downdrop faults instead of thrusting upwards. Uh, that's the pattern that we see today in the middle. And it also provides space, of course, for magma to form and volcanoes to occur. So that's something of the story of the Basin and Range province, which is some of the most spectacular country, probably the, the most famous of those valleys and basins between the ranges uh, would be Death Valley. And here's another picture of Basin Range and how they develop as a result of faulting. So you've had extension and faulting and resulting sedimentation in the basins. So the Great Salt Lake would lie in one of those basins. Writing underneath, subduction of the spreading ridge of the Pacific Ocean in the last 20 million years has resulted in approximately 100% expansion of the basin and range region. For example, the state of Nevada. Here's a big oblique and, of course, snow crap ridges, faults that I've uh, probably guessed at, marked in dotted lines there. And they're in a sort of on the echelon pattern, surprise geologists use, where there's a stepping over of the faults, successive stepping over of the faults, not one continuous line uh, for hundreds of kilometres, but might go for 20 or 30 kilometres and then step across and then step across again. Echelon, of course, uh, or I guess a French word on echelon, uh, phrase is often used with um, uh, soldiers of the um, 18th century or something where you had echelons of uh, uh, foot soldiers ready to come in as the first lot were slaughtered. 
So we're moving on from the basin and range, which is now up in the top west of um, Utah there. And we're going into the uh, four state corner region, uh, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, uh, and the Colorado Plateau, which is basically a big uplifted province. And you can sort of imagine a hot spot underneath it resulting from this shallow subducted slab Notable in the Colorado Plateau is the down cutting, of course, of the um, Colorado River and the formation of the Grand Canyon. Slow vertical uplift, I'm reading now, over a broad area from 40 million years ago, following the rise of the Rocky Mountains. Now, that Rocky Mountain rise was the result of the compression that occurred from um, plates colliding initially. And this saw the Colorado Plateau lift from near sea level to as high as 3,000 meters, and uplifts still occurring as evidenced by earthquakes. Now, here's a sort of generalized pattern of how the Colorado uh, Plateau has lifted. Um, and it's not actually faults, it's more flexures, I suppose. These are referred to as monoclines. They're a bit like a normal fault, but um, there's only a limited amount of faulting in those um, zones of um, flexure. So 40 million years ago, it was a pretty simple uh, zone starting to uplift. And today, you have very significant down cutting by erosion as a result of that uplift. Grand Canyon preserves uh, older rocks at the very base. It's carved down through the plateau, exposing the ancient layers. Now, here's the pattern of the uh, grand staircase. Uh, it's just to illustrate that volcanism has come through the entire succession recently. This is the Grand Canyon now in the center of the diagram, showing a group of oblique strata underneath lying on the grey. Now, that are, those oblique strata are actually called the Grand Canyon group or succession, and they come up to about 700 million years in age, and then you get a break, an angular break, to about 500, perhaps 540 million years, I'm not I'm sure of the detailed date, and then the succession up where I've got that um, dark blue line in the Grand Canyon, which is effectively the Paleozoic era. Rocks, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, you know, Devonian, Carboniferous, and Permian, etc., up to about 250 million years. So there's a succession from near the bottom of the canyon from 500 million years to 250 million years. And that's a beautiful succession that we see so gloriously exposed in the north wall of the canyon. As you move eastwards, you get to Zion Canyon and rocks exposed are Mesozoic in age. That's uh, Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous. And further east again, Bryce Canyon. We are dealing there with the Cenozoic, uh, with, with which we are much more familiar. The rocks of Blanche Point uh, through to the, what you get in the latest ones in the city of Adelaide or the outwash clays of the Hindmarsh clay. Just reading the bottom, the section of the Colorado Plateau from the Grand Canyon to Bryce Canyon is called the Grand Staircase because it has representations of rocks from 1.84 billion years amongst that grey sequence of the base. These are from the Precambrian era, which starts about 540. And there are also sequences from Paleozoic, Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras as you run up to the Bryce Canyon. It's one of the more complete sections of strata on Earth, although, of course, there are breaks in it. And this is taken off the web. The Grand Canyon story began nearly two billion years ago when two plates of this crust collided, and as they came together, rows of volcanic islands smashed together and merged. Under extreme heat and pressure, their rocks transformed into the dark-colored basement rocks seen near the bottom of the canyon today. And these include the 1.84 billion year old rocks called the Elves Chasm Nice. And Nice is more or less a granite that's been highly stressed. These were foliated, meaning it's been sheared and uh, you no longer recognize the crystals as 
adequately because they're smeared out. But uh, this is the oldest known sequence in the canyon. And then for a period after that, between about 1.75 and 1.25 billion years ago, you have a gap. And then erosion, erosion erased rocks from that period, like chapters ripped out of history book. The story picks up again between 1.25 billion and 730 million years ago, where the layers of new rock, known as the Grand Canyon Supergroup, intermittently formed. Now, 730 million years in our sense relates about to the Burrow Group, so the rocks of the um, Adelaide Hills um, south of uh, Mitcham, for example, or around Torrens Gorge are um, around the same age as the top of that Grand Canyon supergroup. Um, near the Grand Canyon, you do get exposures of the ice ages, which start to appear at about that time, just after um, 730 million years, we have um, the Sturt glaciation and then the Maranoan glaciation, as we sometimes refer to it in literature later on, which occurs in our successions, or they occur from Sturt Gorge round to Marino. And uh, I can say that they're about the same age as the Burrow Group and the Flinders Malfty Ranges, and they may have been deposited in fairly close proximity to one another. That's the amazing thing, as the continents of um, Laurentia, as North America is known, and Australia and Antarctica were very closely jammed together in the supercontinent Rodinia many years ago. And uh, they started to separate about 800 million years ago and fully separated somewhere of the order of uh, 700 million years ago. So at the time of the Great Ice Ages, we were probably one and the same supercontinent and very close together. You might have been able to step off from um, Broken Hill to Denver in those days. And I say that because Eastern Australia didn't exist and nor did the uh, Rocky Mountain system of North America. So you'd have to be from somewhere near Broken Hill to keep your feet dry getting to Denver um, 700 million years ago. Rocks at the base, uh, highly deformed, intruded by a brown looking granitic rock. Um, and you can see the twisted and uh, folded, they are very old and very deformed. Then there's the smooth line dipping at about 25 degrees to the right and including the red dot, which is the uh, Grand Canyon supergroup we've been talking about. And the lot rocks above that are effectively flat lying. They start uh, somewhere of the order of 540 million years, which is about the base of a Cambrian. And uh, they have almost a complete uh, representation of the Paleozoic era in that uh, north wall of the canyon. Now reading the sediments that form the upper two thirds of the Grand Canyon walls, the limestones, shales and sandstones are younger than 508. Well, I should have said 540 million years, I suppose. At the canyon's rim, the cream colored Kabib limestone which is only, uh, well, 270 to 250 million years, is at an elevation of 2,500 metres above sea level. Obviously, many of these strata were formed below sea level initially, uh, but that was, uh, as we say, something like 250 to 500 million years ago. At Bryce Canyon, the same formation, the Kabib limestone, which is 2,500 metres above sea level here, is uh, in the subsurface only reaches about 300 meters above sea level so that all the younger units have been removed by erosion in this region of the grand canyon due to its uplift there's been less, less uplift uh, as you progress from as uh, to zion and bryce canyons beautiful view up looking upstream in the grand canyon and the oldest basement rocks there in the middle are quite dark. Um, and if you uh, use the eye of faith in the foreground, uh, bottom left, you can see uh, the angle of unconformity of the horizontal strata cutting just a little triangle of um, the Grand Canyon supergroup. 
and then the older dark rocks underneath that. Looking at the entire Paleozoic era here from 250 million years at its youngest, the Kabib uh, limestone, down to about 540 million years, where the very distinct horizontal layering starts. Because we're actually talking here about uh, what is a geological unconformity term used, of course, a lot by geologists. It's where you have a time break in a sequence of rocks. The first term we use is an angular unconformity and that illustrated just to the right there where you have perhaps have 200 million year old rocks lying at an angle on rocks that have been tilted that are 500 million years old and that red line would be the angular unconformity for erosion surface where there'd been a phase of folding erosion and then deposition of a new sequence horizontally Sometimes this occurs without deformation of the older sequence, but you're missing, still missing 300 million years of history. And this is called a disconformity, where it's difficult enough, so quite often, to trace the actual section that's missing 300 million years on an erosion surface because the layers are all horizontal. And the other type of uh, unconformity is generally referred to as a non-conformity and that's where you have sediments lying on much older igneous rocks or metamorphic rocks that don't have a distinct layering that represents the ancient sea floors so you have a non-conformity above a granite or above um, a deformed granite or gneiss as i referred to it so we have three distinct types and we'll sometimes refer to it quickly as the angular unconformity or disconformity or the like. It's illustrated well in the Grand Canyon succession. Ooh, here is the succession. I won't go into too much detail. On the left, we have the absolute ages, 250 million years to 500 million years, most approximate there. And then the older rocks are referred to as Precambrian, which is a huge stretch of time, you might say, older than 540 million years. Uh, goes right back to 4.6 billion years. It's all Precambrian. And the Cambrian, which is the lowest unit there, marked in the column where there's only one initial, uh, there's a C with a bar through it, which stands for Cambrian. That's the interval. Uh, 80 million years or so, I don't actually remember the detail, but it starts at 541 million years. It's the sequence in which you first recognize normal animal groups that we can define by the phyla we use today, the shelly fossils, cephalopods, that's the things like trilobites, uh, um, the ancient form of the crayfish, you might say, uh, all sorts of things, with the possible exception of um, fish with backbones didn't quite appear at this time. Uh, and you'll notice marked in red is the angular unconformity between the um, base of Cambrian to peach sandstone and the uh, Grand Canyon supergroup, which is a little darker gray. And there are intrusive rocks cutting through the non-conformity at the base of that succession. And of course, if we can get it, could get an age on those, we'd know the oldest succession of the Grand Canyon supergroup, which is probably of the order of a billion or a billion, 1.2 billion years. Of course, geologists are able to determine the um, environments of deposition by careful examination of the rock types. And I won't read these in detail, but looking at the red records there, the Tapeach sandstone is a near shore deposit. And then you go into a muddy sea floor and an offshore sequence. Then it goes back to brackish water environments and then a marine or a deeper sea deposit for the red wall limestone, which is a very famous unit, forms a distinct pathway around um, or ledge around the Grand Canyon wall. And then there's a karst landscape, uh, which has been developed on land, very like the karst that we have here at Mount Gambia on the Gambia limestone. Um, very distinct characteristics of um, sinkholes, caves and so forth developed in that limestone. 
and then you had a disconformity with the sea coming in and getting a delta a to near shore and beach environments of the supai group. And then uh, again, as we finally get to the top, Guy uh, Bob limestone, you've got marine uh, limestones deposited offshore. So there's been sea coming in, sea going out, uh, and the uh, various rock types or lithologies, as a geologist would say, the rock types um, are interpreted to indicate the transgressions and regressions of the sea. Here's an illustration of the early part of that. So about 540 million years ago, possibly, we had the Cambrian seas transgressing over the old basement rocks and over the segment of Grand Canyon supergroup that was preserved on that erosion surface. In fact, it's not straight a flat line. That erosion surface has hills and dales and valleys um, in detail, but this is just illustrated in a very simple way to show that angular unconformity on the Grand Canyon supergroup, which uh, probably occurred somewhere in the order of 540 million years ago. And there's a whole section missing there, which would relate to the younger rocks of our Adelaide region, such as we see around Fleurieu Peninsula and the Eastern Adelaide Hills, or in the Flinders Ranges, uh, uh, even in the Brachner type geological section, the Brachner geological section, that's about where the missing sequence occurs in the Grand Canyon. But very similar things occur in the region around the Grand Canyon uh, where exposure is, is uh, appropriate. There we can see how the various units uh, were formed by gradual in ingression of the sea and regression again. So shallow seas repeatedly covered that region of the Grand Canyon. Uh, and it says through the last 500 million years, well, if we take the sequence right up to the Bryce Canyon, we are talking about everything up to about uh, 30 million years ago. Here again, the same illustration, this time the relative geological time scale is shown on the right with that pre-Cambrian era sequence going up to 540 million years, followed by uh, the Paleozoic units. Now, um, the Americans use Mississippi and Pennsylvania uh, we tend to use Carboniferous, or we do use Carboniferous following the Devonian. And uh, in that case, much of the Devonian is missing on the uh, disconformity in the centre of that section. And finally, uh, we get up to the Permian, which closes about 250 million years ago. So we have sequences of classification Obviously, we give the rock units names like red wall limestone, they're forming the great cliff in the center. Um, and we have uh, relative geological terms. And the Mississippian is really, uh, and Pennsylvanian were coal forming regions of Europe and, uh, and North America. Whereas our coals are younger and relate uh, more closely to the Permian interval at the top. And we also have the ice ages of the southern continents of Gondwana during the Permian, which they don't see in North America. North America by this time, or Laurentia, had separated from South Australia and was therefore not exposed to that uh, Gondwanan glaciation. So just looking again at a grand picture of the uh, uh, Grand Canyon, the lower Precambrian rocks there, and I've dotted the, um, the break at 540 million year unconformity and uh, outlined in the bottom right hand corner, the uh, Grand Canyon supergroup. <coughs> so it gives a marvelous picture of 250 million years of history with some very much older rocks underneath that unconformity. So there, again, a little bit vague in that one, I've taken off the web, but that's the so-called great unconformity at 540 million years, truncating the uh, sequence of a Grand Canyon supergroup that's dipping away to the right at about uh, uh, 15, 20 degrees. And then below that, 
sequence is the much older and more deformed and altered um, rocks of the uh, uh, Precambrian. One more view looking up canyon and the little Colorado coming in on the right, I think. Uh, dark rocks are the oldest, and then the succession, the red wall, uh, not perhaps standing proudly in the distance, but it stands proudly. Um, in the foreground cliff face. So uh, the Kebab, Kebab limestone forms the top of the plateau leading away to the east. Oh, I just popped this one out of the web. Um, people have lived in the Grand Canyon, they say, for 12,000 years. It's about as long as they've really established uh, living uh, peoples on the North American continent. Um, although they've presumably been there five or 6,000 years longer than that. But uh, here the granaries uh, are perched along the Colorado River, obviously there for safekeeping of their crops. Uh, so there must have been marauding, Indi marauding Indian tribes in those years. Looking at uh, one form of geological map, this is more a structural map than a uh, normal geological map because the age of the rocks are not shown, or not coloured in. Just the faults are illustrated, and uh, the black lines represent, uh, for the most part, uh, normal faults. The U's and D's represents upside and downside. But the dotted lines are not roads, as one might expect, but they're those monoclines, as illustrated in the top of the two cross sections and uh, non or uh, westerly trending zones with the uplift in the central region down dropping on either side to elevate the main region of the um, Colorado Plateau. So it's not simple. There's still many faults and monoclinal folds or flexures, which are shown here by uh, the double dash nine in the case of the uh, monoclinal flexures. And just to give a bit of a picture of the Colorado Plateau in a 3D diagram, uh, there's been that uplift. Originally, the ancestral Upper Colorado actually uh, drained northward, as I understand it, where uh, uh, in the last uh, oh, 15, 20 million years, it's uh, capt been captured by westward flowing rivers and become the main Colorado Gorge as a result of uh, river capture. You can see the upwarp, so-called kebab upwarp there, just a bend uh, which leaves a, a trough accessible to erosion for the ancestral upper Colorado in that case. I'm reading this, the river systems were established 50 million years ago, but the kebab uh, monoclinal upwarp resulted in river captures about 9 million years ago that vastly increased the flow rate of the Colorado River and resulted in its downcutting. In the last million years, a number of volcanic lava flows have cascaded over the outer rim of the Grand Canyon, forming frozen lava falls. These formed a series of barriers or lava dams across the river. Uh, and there've been 12 of these flows in the past uh, million years or so. It took approximately 20,000 years for the dams to be destroyed. And they indicate that for the last million years, um, the canyon's been about the same depth because they've been preserved as um, rapids really in the floor of the canyon. And they would have been eroded away if there'd been much down cutting subsequently. So here's another view of the grand uh, staircase, but this time we're going from uh, uh, Grand Canyon in the left hand side there. So um, the staircase within the canyon illustrates the Paleozoic era, while much more spread out uh, across the broad doming of the Colorado Plateau, uh, running from the chocolate kiff cliffs through almost to the, well, to the gray cliffs, you have uh, the uh, Zion canyon cutting down through the gray and white cliffs. Uh, and uh, that is the next succession, the Mesozoic succession or Mesozoic era rocks. 
They extend from 250 to 65 million years and they include Jurassic, Jurassic Cretaceous. And then in the last 65 million years, you have the Cenozoic rocks of the Bryce Canyon leading up to the youngest deposited very recently. And my writing there, depositional environments around Zion Canyon over the period 270 to 65 million years ago fluctuated from shallow seas to coastal plains and a desert of massive windblown sand dunes. Sedimentation continued until over 3,000 metres of thickness accumulated. So we look a little bit at the uh, Zion Canyon now. And there's a section more or less as you drive into the Zion Canyon National Park. And you can see there are 100 million years of history in the cliffs. Uh, and again, we name the youngest rock layers, youngest being uh, lava flows, cinder cones, and so on. And then the various formations, starting with uh, Carmel and Temple Gap, going down at the base to the Kaibab, which we've seen at the top of the Grand Canyon. Again, all these formations have been examined in detail and interpreted for whether they were desert sand dunes as that main bluff of the Navajoe sandstone. There's uh, desert sand dunes and it covered 150,000 square miles of this uh, four state region of the United States and uh, really records the shifting winds and aridity uh, during the deposition, which created uh, some very dramatic cross stratified sandstones. And we'll refer to those in a later picture. But otherwise, uh, the earlier successions there were deposited by shallow seas and streams, etc. And of course, on the right, are the descriptive rock names. So this is a bit blurry, it's taken off the web. I do have pictures of my own, but I'll just search them out. So that's the Navajoe sandstone. Dunes are preserved very clearly in that. And uh, that's as, we, as one would drive into the uh, National Park region. Very dramatic picture. There's the access road in, again from the web. Here, the Navajoe sandstone, which is about 180, 200 million years old, you can see strata um, are more or less horizontal here. The pink going to uh, like fawny color across the middle of the photo is the stra real strata, um, which are flat lying. But within the strata, you can see uh, lineations or lines all, uh, can I say, dipping to the right. And these are the um, four sets of dune systems that moved across and then eroded, probably with very heavy winds or something, uh, eroded to a flat level, and a new one came across. Sometimes these are deposited actually in braided streams, but mostly um, it's the migration of sand dunes um, blown by the wind. Uh, it's not conducive to much in the way of fossil pres preservation. So you don't really see uh, grand successions of dinosaurs, which you get in other areas of the United States, because deserts don't uh, tend to preserve the uh, animal remains. Certainly for a short period, there are lots of dying animals, but they're just uh, the odd bone, but not good preservation. Now, I think we're moving on to the Bryce Canyon region, to the younger succession younger really than 100 million years, which is within the Cretaceous period. That extends up to 66 million years when um, there was an enormous change in both animal life on land and uh, uh, life in the oceans, apparently as a result of a huge infall of a meteoric body to Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And this influenced, of course, this region of the United States significantly. The records of dinosaurs disappear at that point as do huge changes in vegetation and animal life in general. And the same thing in the oceans worldwide. So that, that um, Cretaceous to tertiary boundary is spoken of as uh, a KT boundary. It's uh, remarkably sharp. 
tends to indicate this impact from an extraterrestrial body. Uh, again, we have symbols for different types of sediment, which mean more to the geologist than will be to us. But um, a little brickwork up near the top, the white limestone member and the pink limestone member. Brickwork we use it is characteristic of um, carbonate rocks, limestone sometimes uh, dolomite, which is only a, a lime rock with um, some magnesium included, replacing the calcium. But uh, you also draw these stratigraphic columns to scale so that uh, a metric scale is shown there and the uh, uh, center right at the top, just uh, some 600 meters, suggesting the whole thing is about 2,000, 2,500 meters thick. And each individual unit is given an um, estimated mean thickness. Uh, so it makes sense to the geologist that the wire weep uh, formation is thicker than most others, for example, and the pink limestone is thicker than white limestone. So reading, um, this is a stratigraphic column of the Bryce Canyon region, everything laid out in a vertical column, which comprises pink and white limestone and various sandy deposits. The column is drawn up with each rock unit given its typical thickness and usually a symbol that represents the rock type. And the total thickness here is 2,400 metres. And uh, as I say, mainly grey, brown, and uh, white sandstones and shales. But the very characteristic uh, unit of the Bryce National Park is the Claren Formation. I think it's 50 to 60 million years old. It uh, is limey and sandy, and the lime tends to uh, weather, leaving these pinnacles, um, geomorphological feature in certain areas. That's looking along the uh, Claren Formation in the Bryce National Park from the viewpoints for tourism. Of course, as you get this extraordinary um, ghost-like uh, weathering phenomenon, it uh, is very characteristic of the younger succession of the uh, Colorado Plateau. Uh, again, it's uh, Claren formation about 50 million years old. And here again, uh, one off the web, which people perhaps have visited Bryce and their own pictures of this sort of thing. Um, they have names for all these various uh, geomorphological features, but their rainfall effectively on carbonate cemented rock and the carbonate dissolves protected by harder layers. Here we go again. So that's uh, the characteristic of the youngest succession of the Colorado Plateau. And here with an overlook, a very, very spectacular scene at sunset. So just in review, uh, we've uh, done the section which is in the, uh, from right of center, Grand Canyon, um, with its older rocks preserved and exposed in the deepest parts of the canyon. Then due to a monocline or a flexure, uh, you tend to get the uh, relatively younger rocks preserved in the Zion Canyon. And as this section illustrates, perhaps a little higher elevation at Bryce Canyon and things like the uh, Kaibab uh, limestone, which are at the very crest of the Grand Canyon, uh, down a few hundred metres subsurface. There's representation of rocks from 1.84 billion years from the Precambrian era and era. And sequences from the Paleozoic, Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras. It's one of the fullest sections of strata on Earth. I'll uh, leave that point now and uh, open for some questions.